So to begin with, hello, um, welcome to the webinar on how to convene a session at EGU24. My name is Simon Clark. I'm EGU's project manager at the executive office. Um, and today we'll have about one hour, uh, which will feature a presentation and guidance on how to convene a session. We have time for audience questions and answers afterwards. If you have a question, please enter it in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. There you'll be able to type in a, a question. Um, you can also view other people's questions and upvote them if you also want that question answered. This webinar will also be available as a recording and resource. The recording will be published on the EGU YouTube channel uh, a week after this presentation. So you can expect it to be online Tuesday next week. Uh, so to get back into the meat of the webinar itself, um, today what today's webinar will be presented by Dan Evans, who's a veteran of many sessions at the General Assembly and our incoming early career scientist union representative. Um, he is a lecturer in soil science at Cranfield University in the United Kingdom and was previously the early career scientist representative for the soil sciences, uh, soil system sciences division at EGU. In recent years, he's chaired the Early Career Researcher Conference for the British Society of Soil Science, as well as Early Career Sessions at the European Soil Observatory. His contributions have been recognised um, at this year's General Assembly as a receptor of the Arne Richter Award for Outstanding Early Career Scientist. Um, Dan has attended seven General Assemblies, has convened multiple sessions, including short courses, town halls, sprint meetings, and network events since 2018. So that's enough of me. If Dan, if you would like to take it away. Hello to everyone here on this webinar. It's great to be here. And um, as Simon says there, this will be coming up to, I think, my eighth EGU General Assembly. Um, but one thing I can say at the very top here is that you never really stop learning. So um, for those seasoned conveners who are also joining today, um, or uh, are viewing this via the EGU YouTube channel, um, I'm sure you'll agree that there's always things to learn. Uh, but if you're here for the first time and perhaps you're thinking about convening uh, some of your first sessions at this year's uh, 2024 uh, EGU General Assembly, then uh, a really warm welcome to the General Assembly family and I hope that you enjoy uh, convening uh, your session. So. What I wanted to do today is just present uh, some support and guidance around how to convene, perhaps some of the updates and maybe some small changes uh, to this particular uh, General Assembly. Um, and also uh, what the kind of the role is both during and uh, before and after uh, the session. Being a convener is not just about being at the session and leading a, a session. It's a it's a um, many weeks, perhaps many months long process. So we'll talk about that. I'm very happy to take your questions via the chat and fielding those um, at the end of the presentation. So I'm going to share my screen now. Um, so yes, yeah, just a, a brief hello from me, um, the incoming union-wide uh, early career scientist representative for, for uh, uh, the EGU. So um, what I wanted to do really um, is kind of break it down, perhaps, because this is um, one of the largest, if not the largest, geosciences event in Europe. Um, and so for those who are new to EGU, um, who've not been to the General Assembly, um, it might be a touch overwhelming at first. So I wanted to break this down into the, the core components of, of what the GA looks like. So we'll look at orals, posters and picos separately. Um, but being a convener um, of, uh, of, of all three, in fact, I think over my last seven or eight years, um, there's, uh, there's things, there's still hints and tips and tricks that you can uh, have up your sleeve both whilst you're there at the conference and uh, the weeks beforehand. So we're in this really interesting period leading up to the General Assembly this year now, last couple of weeks for those who are, are, are viewing this live. Uh, this is, in a sense, um, perhaps crunch time for the communion party, but I just wanted to break it down to make sure that you're uh, fully aware of what that looks like. So it seems like my presentation is going to move on itself, um, which is a good thing, so I don't, stop, uh, I don't ramble on. So 
there's um, presentation modes, two kind of main presentation modes. The first really is um, an online supplementary display material. And, and what does this mean? Well, basically, this is material uploaded to the General Assembly website. It's um, only really available to, to those registered um, attendees. And um, what the community can do, the geoscience community do, can view the content and comment on it um, between the 25th of March and the 31st of May. So although we have the General Assembly, which is one week in duration, the geoscience community can view and comment on this material. And it also means that you can uh, update some of this uh, material as well leading up to um, uh, the event. And so on the actual event, the General Assembly is uh, one week, as, as many of you know. Um, we have uh, a, a range of um, different types of presentations, uh, which we'll go through in a second. And the presentation files for those, um, I can see this is going to go and do that for the rest of the presentation. Um, but the presentation files are uploaded to the EGU website, um, and those have to be there at least 24 hours prior to the start of the session. So that's a, a key thing to remind all of your um, participants and contributors to the, to the sessions that you're convening. Um, and uh, the, uh, the main tip here really is that communication all the way through this process is, is the key. So if you're in touch with your contributors, please do remind them to upload their materials for that asynchronous discussion um, as, as soon as possible, at least 24 hours before the session starts. Okay. So I mentioned three types. There are three types of presentation formats, um, orals, posters, and PICOs, um, and I'll explain each one in turn. Um, and I think the EGU itself is, is quite unique in having these, but they are all of equal measure. But let's go to um, the oral presentations first and uh, talk about some of the things relating to sessions that have oral presentations. So, um, oral presentations this year, uh, as many years have gone by now, uh, are timed at 10 minutes. Uh, but this includes the changeover and the discussion time. So it includes question and answers and the time it takes to change over from one author to another. Um, solicited presentations, if you have them in your session, can be up to 30 minutes. They can be either 10, 20 or 30 minutes. And you'll find uh, probably by now you've got your letter of schedule, which means that your session, if you're convening it this year, uh, will be scheduled for a very specific day and time block. And I can show you those time blocks in just a second. And the big thing here is that the time slot really can't exceed the assigned session time. So you really have to keep the presentations within your assigned time block. Um, the mode is fully hybrid. So um, basically we have a combination of those presenters giving live presentations on site, and they will be in charge of forwarding their own slides and presenters virtually can be uh, virtually presenting. They'll be encouraged to present live, but can, if they want, submit pre-recorded material. Um, and those virtual presenters are also encouraged to download uh, Zoom software. Uh, so if you're um, viewing uh, this uh, webinar live, uh, you'll know that uh, you're using uh, some Zoom software. The Zoom is best accessed via the software rather than the browser. And there's the bandwidth information if you want to get into the technical aspects of the Zoom there. Just make sure that everything uh, is smooth and coherent uh, on the actual day. So that's a kind of whittle stop tour of all presentations. Let me take you then to the posters and, and how is this different? Well, in many ways, um, it isn't that different. We have both on-site and virtual presentations. The on-site poster presenters will be organised in sessions that either will be in the morning um, or in the afternoon. And I'll show you those time blocks in, in just a second for, uh, for poster presenters. And virtual posters, so in other words, those accessing the General Assembly from uh, outside of the, the conference venue, will be scheduled during uh, time block three um, of, of the week. Um, for those who are on site, they're hanging their posters up or affixing them to the poster boards, um, will be asked and encouraged to stand by their posters during their given time block. Um, and for the virtual presenters, 
um, we'd like the participants, if possible, to use the virtual poster boards in Gather Town. We can talk about that a little bit later on as well. So here's the time block uh, information for this particular General Assembly. You'll see that uh, TB is, is time block TB1 and TB2. Um, you display your poster if you're in uh, either the, one of those two time blocks um, between 8.30 uh, in the morning um, uh, and 1.30 in the afternoon. Um, and then there's a changeover period at uh, 12.30 to 1.30 we ask the um, time block one uh, and time block two presenters to basically uh, remove their posters. Uh, the conference assistants will be discarding any remaining ones from around 1.30, which then um, opens the, the doors for time block three and time block four from two o'clock. So if you're in time block three or time block four for posters, you're displaying the posters between two and six in the afternoon. Uh, the virtual poster attendance, uh, as I said before, was always going to be in time block three of any given day. And that virtual poster attendance will be between two and 3.45. And uh, for time block four, um, we have uh, the on-site uh, attendance time uh, between uh, 4.15 and six o'clock. So basically at six o'clock, if you have a poster up for those afternoon sessions, um, you can take those down uh, from nine o'clock. The conference assistants will discard any remaining um, poster so that it's uh, uh, the boards are available for the, the subsequent day. All of this information is available uh, online and I can show you the link at the end of this presentation. Which leads me then to the PICO presentation slot. And uh, for PICOs, if you've not been to the GA before, it's a really interesting um, interactive um, poster, if you like. It's uh, allowing the it allows the opportunity for the authors to give a two minute summary, um, almost like an abstract of their research. And then there's an opportunity for some detailed presentation and discussion with the attendees. Um, both, uh, as I say, at the venue and also virtually. And so it, this really encourages those who are in PICO um, presentations to be very creative uh, around their um, media. You can display animations and videos and um, put things together more digitally um, as well. So for the on-site presenters, uh, just like the posters, we encourage those authors to stand by the PICO screen. So as conveners, it's always good to um, uh, assemble your, your office uh, as, uh, as best as possible around their PICO screens uh, during the session. And then for virtual presenters, if they can use uh, Gather Town, and this is an opportunity to have some interactive um, uh, live, um, as it were, um, real-time discussions with the virtual attendees. Um, and all presentations, whether you're on-site or whether you're uh, viewing things virtually will be available for browsing. So even if you're on site, you can still see the virtual presentations. And that also goes for posters um, as well. So for more guidelines on the kind of particular um, format, the oral Pico and poster presenters guidelines, um, uh, you can find that on the website. And for conveners in particular, it's good to um, send these links to your authors um, before the conference. So how are we going to get ready then uh, for the for the GA? So as I said before, there is uh, uh, perhaps some slight changes to the to the timings um, to, uh, to to take care uh, aware of and you can see these on the website. I'm just putting up the time blocks uh, as they are now. Um, so these uh, run, four time blocks run all the way throughout the day between half past eight and six o'clock uh, with an afternoon and morning coffee break and a 90 minute lunchtime session as there. Uh, networking will take place after six, um, followed by medal and award lectures. So if you're a convener of a session, it's likely that you're going to be in, um, uh, involved in, in one of these, uh, if not more, of these time blocks. But what happens before? So it's not just about when you're at the GA, it's it's what do you do as conveners um, before the before the event? So the weeks before the event, it's good to select a minimum of, of two chairpersons per time block, um, as is uh, appropriate for the format. So what we're saying there is that the 
um, conveners not, are not necessarily the chairpersons in uh, a session. It may well be that the convener is the chairperson, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the case. But um, all we're saying is that most time blocks are best served with two chairpersons. Um, and that is particularly important when we're thinking about um, on-site and virtual attendance as well, this kind of hybrid format. So conveners should really ensure that at least one chairperson is there at the conference centre who can run the on-site session. And then the second chairperson can moderate and interact with the virtual attendees and kind of take care of the, the virtual attendees and their virtual contributions. Uh, for PICOs in particular, though, we say that um, sorry, uh, two on-site chairs are needed. And uh, this is important because one of these chairpersons will take care of on-site presenters and uh, the other will manage the interactions with the virtual presenters. So a little bit like um, the orgs and, and posters. It's, it's good to have at least two chairs for, for, for PICOs. Uh, also, um, between now and the G8, it's good to nominate three to five judges uh, per presentation. Uh, and I'll have a little bit more information about OSPP in just a moment. Uh, so bear with me for that. Um, also, you know, as I said before, use this as a, a time to communicate to your authors. So use the mailing list tool on your um, uh, conveners portal. And many of you who are convening this year will have um, become acquainted with the EGU um, conveners pages. So use that mailing list tool to contact the authors presenting in the session and provide them any final information or essential information that they may need. And then obviously um, before, you know, the week before and leading up to the last few days before the, the session, do make sure and encourage any authors that haven't um, that the presentations are uploaded at least, as I said before, 24 hours prior to the session start. And if there are any uh, events planned, um, uh, maybe a splinter meeting uh, uh, as associated with the session, or perhaps there is a, a post-session dinner, um, uh, that information of, uh, often is, is best communicated before the event. Um, for those who haven't attended, the GA can be incredibly busy, and it's good to communicate as much information before the GA start as possible. And that basically allows um, the only the very vital information um, that needs to be communicated during the GA um, uh, to, to be kind of reserved for the week uh, of, the, of the conference. So if you are um, booking any event or planning any event um, before, during, after um, the, the GA um, uh, associated with your session, uh, then do communicate the information um, as soon as possible. I mentioned about OSPP. So this is the Outstanding Student and PhD candidate presentation uh, content. And once again, uh, I'm taking this directly from the EGU24 website. Um, so if you're a convener uh, this year, you should really check if any contributions in your in your session are participating in the OSPP contest. And, and this is up to the individual author uh, to decide whether they want to uh, participate in the scheme. So do check if you've got any uh, presentations um, participating in, in, such the, in such a contest. And you can find that information out using your convener's pages. Um, as I said before, at least three judges are ideally need to be identified. And this is one uh, role of the conveners before the, before the session. And you can use your OSPP nominator tool uh, to do that. So there is a, uh, a list of volunteers um, uh, available judges in a sense, um, chairs and conveners can also um, be uh, judges and you can also add colleagues as judges as well um, but obviously please make sure that they agree to serve uh, as a judge and that they are going to attend uh, the GA. Um, the judges obviously um, will not be able to be co-authors of any abstracts that they evaluate um, they do need to have earned uh, a PhD um, or equivalent, and obviously uh, they cannot participate in the OSPP contest um, on, on the year. So OSPP is a really, really engaging, very, very exciting. It's a really good opportunity to, um, I think, um, celebrate some of the works of our early career scientists uh, in the EGU and um, Having uh, as many judges volunteering as possible to help out with this process is often best. But do 
try to nominate those judges as soon as possible. And uh, if obviously there are any uh, delays, um, then uh, then you can contact your um, uh, your division president uh, for more information about that. If there's been any changes to your program, so it, uh, if there's a particular change to the session, um, then you can forward the information uh, directly to egu24 at copernicus.org. And these are, um, this is essentially the email address uh, to communicate any last minute modifications. Uh, and if feasible, um, these changes, these modifications will be included in the daily program of the lecture room uh, and the Pico spot displayed on site. Um, but changes to the daily programme are really only possible until the 8th of April. So uh, if you do foresee any last minute modifications, um, it's the 2nd of April as I'm talking live now. So uh, do make sure those are communicated as soon as possible to EGU24 at copernicus.org. And once again, that, web, that email address is on the EGU website. Um, and of course, it's always possible that um, authors will withdraw their abstract uh, at last minute or perhaps not show up at the session. And, and this is um, uh, no reflection of, of you as a convener. Uh, this happens across the board every single GA um, for various reasons. And of course, um, we don't need to go into into those uh, now, those, those various reasons. But what we do ask uh, authors is that if they are thinking about withdrawing the abstracts, that they do so as early as conveniently possible uh, when they realise that they are unable to present their work. So this may be just something to um, uh, ask uh, of the uh, or remind the presenters um, when you're um, you're speaking to them or communicating information to them uh, online uh, prior to the uh, event. Um, if an oral presentation in your session is marked as withdrawn, um, then if you are a convener of the session, you can really make constructive use of the time. It doesn't need to be necessarily um, a gap in the schedule. You can use that to have a discussion with those in the room and, of course, um, those um, uh, viewing things and contributing virtually. Um, or, of course, if you've got a standby oral presentation, um, you can have um, one of your uh, poster presenters uh, giving a, a standby oral presentation. Uh, in my experience, that is less often uh, the case. What I've done in the past is uh, given a kind of summary of the posters at the session. So in other words, uh, if you've got uh, a 10 minute gap uh, because of, of uh, uh, an oral presenter not showing up, uh, not in attendance, um, at, in the session, you use that 10 minutes to go through some of the highlights of the poster session. Um, so the reason why we might not just go instantly to um, the next um, available or presenter is that often it's the case, uh, and I speak from personal experience here, that uh, if you want to, if, you, if people are wanting to see a particular presentation, they will have that information in their program and they will have, uh, in a sense, um, uh, an itinerary of, of which presentations they're going to visit. And if they go into a session um, at a particular time to see that presentation and they've found that uh, the presentation has already been viewed because of a no show earlier on, uh, that can sometimes, um, uh, you know, distract or um, uh, uh, be a... a, a, a uh, a sign of 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 uh, practice. So what we say for good convening practice is if you allow a space and only then start the the next available or when it's programmed, that allows people who are um, uh, especially kind of traveling across the venue to get to that particular presentation that they've been waiting a year to see uh, to see it on time and and so they don't miss it. That's basically the reason why we we say make constructive use of the time. If a poster author, of course, um, agrees to, to give an oral presentation at one of the solutions I mentioned earlier, um, then you can send a program change to that EGU24 email address. Um, if they can do that before the 9th of April, that's great. Uh, and do include all the relevant abstract numbers there. Uh, no shows are monitored um, throughout the, uh, the, the conference. And so if, for instance, an abstract is not presented, not withdrawn, um, or withdrawn after the, the scheduled presentation, or perhaps no warning was given to the conveners, 
um, in, in either case, then the abstract will be withdrawn from the online program and affected um, the materials will be taken down from uh, from the website. So it's always good if you are now, uh, uh, you know, an author or a uh, contributor um, to the uh, the conference this year, if you are thinking about drawing an abstract, obviously hoping that you're not, but if you are thinking of doing it, then um, do please do so. Um, uh, communicate to your conveners. So just before the session then, um, you uh, ideally want to get into the venue, prepare any necessary materials, any scripts or, or speeches that you're going to give at the introduction. Um, you arrive early, familiarise yourself with the venue and introduce yourself to the technical staff as Jane is doing here on the screen. So introduce yourself as a convener to the chairpersons, the presenters, um, the audience within the room. And this allows you um, an opportunity really to ensure that everything is set up and running smoothly. It basically allows you as a convener to settle in to the room, settle in to um, the use of the timer function. You can set particular times on here. So for instance, uh, eight minutes for a presentation followed by a two minute question and answer. Uh, maybe you want to do nine and one, so it's up to you, but do as you arrive into the venue. And if you can do get to the venue, um, uh, the room as early as possible, uh, introduce yourself to all the technical staff there. And there will be a technical staff member in the room um, uh, in each uh, session. So uh, you won't be on your own. There will be people um, with you there. And of course, uh, if you um, uh, do greet the speakers um, as you arrive in, they'll, they'll feel welcome as well. So uh, whether you're a, uh, if you're a convener, you may also be the chair. I just thought it'd be good to show you what happens during the session. So do greet the speakers. Uh, they will control the, um, the session schedule, uh, the, the chair that is. And then um, just to show you that the camera microphone is adjustable. So the speaker can adjust the camera and the microphone in the session. The on-site speaker will be given a remote to move their own slides. And at the end of the presentation, as been shown here, um, the on-site chair will, will manage the questions. So uh, that basically means that if you're in the room, you can walk up to a microphone and ask your question uh, of the author, allowing them to respond. Or of course, uh, if you're viewing things virtually, um, uh, you can uh, ask your question online. So virtual speakers will be introduced uh, by the on-site chair. Um, the slides will be moved on by the conference assistant, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and do remind your, uh, your speakers and attendees that they can continue the discussion online. I think you saw that a minute ago on the screen. You can ask questions of the authors and continue that discussion using the online um, display materials. So yeah, just once again, this is a, a, an indication that, that speakers, if they are in the room, can adjust um, their um, uh, camera microphone, they've got that remote to move their own slides if they are in the room. Virtual speakers will uh, have their slides moved on uh, by the conference assistant. And there on the screen, you can see one of the attendees asking a question of the author um, with one of those microphones. So uh, it's really important that um, if you are an attendee and you want to ask a question, or indeed at any point during the session, you want to communicate something in the room that you do so via the microphone to make sure that those uh, viewing things virtually can can listen to that. Um, and uh, this is the on the screen now you can see how you can comment um, and uh, feedback on the presentations and ask uh, any questions you've got uh, on display materials. So don't feel that if you've not been able to ask your question in the two minutes um, for question and answers or so, um, that uh, you'll never be able to ask that question, that you can do so on the online materials. So uh, just a couple more things. So more information can be sought online. So um, the EGU, uh, European Geoscience Union YouTube channel is really good. Um, it has a, a really good guide of conveners and some of the videos that you saw uh, just a minute ago have been taken from this particular presentation. So. Um, this video here, EGU General Assembly Guide for Conveners, um, is, is really good. And of course, this webinar, uh, as it's being recorded, will also go up on the YouTube as well. That QR code essentially takes you to that video. So I'll allow those who've got their um, phones, their camera phones, um, 
to uh, to snap there. Um, but also uh, there are other little links that you might be interested in as conveners as well, or as uh, potential conveners for, for, for subsequent EGU GA. So um, the General Assembly Rules of Conduct, very important. They are listed um, on the, uh, the top link there. The particular guidelines and the rules for conveners um, are uh, there on the second link. Um, so that will take you to um, the EEGU website um, uh, information for conveners. And then if you're uh, convening for the very first time, and uh, that's that's really great to hear, um, then you can get some advice from early career scientists. There's a little blog piece there on convening for the very first time at the EGU. Um, and then finally, a, a link around making your presentation accessible. So um, a, a really good kind of resource there to use um, for, for that. So that's uh, that concludes the presentation. I'll take any questions uh, in just a moment and Simon uh, will, I think, help me with that. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm very happy to fill them uh, or send them over to Simon. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, obviously, thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, viewing it and, and I hope to see you at the General Assembly and if I don't then I hope you enjoy convening your session at this year's GA. Oh thanks Dan so um, just as we said if you do have a question uh, please input it at the text box uh, at the bottom of the screen it says Q&A has a couple of speech bubbles um, just enter the question there. Um, yeah so let's go into some of the questions um, one of the questions we have is about are all sessions planned to be online? Yes, so um, we, this is a hybrid, a fully hybrid conference. So all rules, posters and presenters um, uh, can, with your viewing on the site or viewing um, from outside the venue, um, can engage with all of the content. And that's really important um, to, to say at this point that um, if you are on site, you can still view the virtual attendees contributions um, as is if you're on site you can also obviously view um, the, uh, the the virtual orals the virtual presenters uh, the virtual posters sorry the virtual picos the other thing of course is that if you're off site you don't necessarily have to be on site to view the uh, presentation so you can view uh, through the zoom link you can then watch the um, the session uh, live uh, through the um, through the zoom link and obviously contribute questions to the chat chat uh, the, the chat function on the Zoom um, and engage after the session using the online display material function. Yeah, um, so as Dad said, I think most uh, sessions online or scientific sessions, great debates, new symposia, etc. Um, there are a couple of small exceptions. So these are splinter meetings, so rooms people book to have meetings in. Um, there's no conference assistance, which means there's uh, no one to kind of manage online presence. So there's no technical solution for that. However, there's Wi-Fi in the conference center. So you could bring your own laptop and use Zoom that way, for example. But the um, the main sessions that are for the program, like scientific sessions, great debate, et cetera, as Dan said, all fully hybrid. Um, Another question from the same person was how to find a Zoom link to moderate and interact with virtual attendees. Maybe we could get some more advice on how to moderate the virtual side of things in the uh, in the session. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the Zoom link um, will be uh, communicated on. So everything, the website really is essentially the, the, the main heart of, of the conference. So you'll be able to find uh, the Zoom link uh, there. Uh, if you are, um, let's say, a convener, but also the chair of um, an oral present uh, oral session, um, you can uh, uh, sit next to your uh, technical person uh, in the room. Uh, they will um, do most of the technical side of things. So, you know, presenting um, the the Zoom session on the screen, uh, dealing with uh, any audio technical issues. Um, but you can um, you you know that Zoom link will will be just like this Zoom where you can have um, a chat function if virtual attendees will um, want to put a question often they do uh, into the question box. It's often good to field questions from the audience and also those from the chat box. In other words, we don't want to disadvantage those who are not at the venue who are contributing uh, questions or thoughts to the chat. So do make sure you have a, a good eye on that. And that's one of the reasons why we often say that two conveners is uh, two chairs are, are good because 
uh, one person could be looking at the, uh, the the virtual side of things whilst the other is managing uh, online. So in terms of moderating and interacting with that, with the virtual attendees, it's, it's, it's important to, to have a balance. Otherwise, uh, those uh, who are not attending uh, on site uh, may well feel disadvantaged. Yeah, and I think it's what you want to emphasize the point that um, you want to make sure there's a, an equality in terms of attention. So the attention given to in-person attendees should also be given to virtual attendees. Um, and this is a part in terms of really just being aware of microphone usage. Um, as I said, they are ne it's needed for online attendees to um, hear people. So that's using it yourself, making sure presenters are standing close to the microphone at the podium. And also when uh, questions come from the in-person um, audience that they um, ask the question for the microphone. If they already have started to ask a question, ask them to repeat it again through the microphone. Um, I also add as well that if you have a gather town component to the um, session, there should be, should be a chairperson online there as well. Um, so this is usually poster sessions, virtual poster sessions, um, have an avatar there, which is um, helping people around if they're accessing it on the virtual conference center. Um, last year, there was guidance on how to use Gather Town. It's not present this year yet on the EGU24, but it's the same platform with a slightly different change in the uh, layout. It's not hugely different. Um, but I will send a link to the EGU23 webpage here. Um, other than the layout, which again isn't a huge change, all the advice in here is still relevant in terms of how to engage Gather Town, how it works, um, advice for which browser to use, etc. Um, I move on to a another question. Um, and it's about the Pico sessions occurring just before network networking time. Uh, will the screen remain on during that time, or will we be switched off at eighteen? Um, I think maybe I could just quickly jump in myself. Typically after the session end, um, the technical support wraps it up um, and starts tidying down the technical uh, setup, making sure it's ready for the day after. Um, there may be some time after session to continue discussion, but it's really encouraged you to take that discussion to the networking um, areas as technical support will wrap up. So it won't be left on uh, for any large duration of time. If you're still discussing things, um, it's asked that you move it to a, a networking event. Um, to move on to the next question, um, are there physical rooms or quiet places for discussions in between co-conveners prior to our session? Dan, would you like to answer that one? Absolutely. So, um, you know, the venue is, is large and it has um, a, a wide array of spaces in which to uh, convene um uh discussions um with the uh uh with, with with your attendees so if you'd like to um uh have a splinter meeting um to uh, uh basically have more of a formal discussion uh, of the, some of the topics um i think those uh, spaces are uh, becoming quite booked up but i think there are some spaces available Simon can correct me if i'm if i'm wrong there those, uh, if you do have a splinter meeting, then those will be assigned to a particular room and that room um, will uh, essentially be um, a, a room which doesn't have online um, or, or any virtual capabilities. Uh, but of course, if you bring your own uh, computer, you can uh, do that. Um, but aside from uh, having a, like a formal splinter meeting to have those kind of formal discussions, um, the venue is, as I say, uh, spacious enough that you can uh, gather in um, uh, in in other spaces. Um, so often I find the coffee um, uh, and lunch um, parts of the of the timetable really quite uh, interactive, really um, uh, really productive in terms of of following up on on topics that perhaps were not discussed too much during the session. So if your session is immediately prior to a coffee break um, or or the lunch break then do encourage your uh, presenters um, to, to use those times to have uh, more uh, detailed discussions. And often sessions, um, uh, if they have a, a kind of critical mass, then uh, 
uh, they can also have things like pop-up networking events as well. So you might want to bring people together um, after the GA, uh, maybe in the evening, for instance, um, of, of a particular day to have a, a session dinner or some session networking. Um, and that also provides time for some discussions. So it's not just during the session that you can discuss with the authors. You can do that uh, before, during and after um, the session. Thanks, Dan. And just to kind of add on top of that, um, for splinter meetings, uh, you can still put in requests for them now. Um, I'll just put the link in the box. Um, uh, but again, these on hybrid supported, at least there will be no technical staff there to support you. Um, I'll also really want to add that pop-up networking events tend to be a really good way to do this as well. Um, I'll just add the link to the pop-up networking program there. You'll be able to see there a green button that says schedule your own pop-up networking event. Uh, you select that, you select some of the tags that might be associated with, for example, is it related to early career scientists, is it of interest to early career scientists, um, is it a social event perhaps, perhaps it also touches on themes like policy. Um, when you organize a pop-up networking event, it appears in the program, the pop-up networking program, sorry. Um, a lot of these tend to be networking, um, networking uh, events, but in previous years, there's also plenty of post-session discussion events that happen here as well. Um, I will know that because that these are all community-led, anyone attending the GA can organize one of these. This program page can also get quite full up as well. So what I advise is that if you do organize a post-session um, pop-up networking event, um, that you also advertise that both in your session and also in the mailing list um, prior to, ahead of us, before your session as well. So I got mixed up in, in time there. Um, uh, yeah, and then the pop-up networking session also offers a number of places. It can be, uh, there are a number of places in the actual conference center itself physically you can meet. It also uh, allows you to advertise for in-person meetings outside a conference center. For example, if you wanted to have a post-session meeting uh, in somewhere, in, somewhere else in Vienna, you can also put that into the session description or the networking event description. Uh, and finally, it also allows you to organize uh, virtual events as well. So you can always put a link to the Need You Gabba Town if you want to use that, or you could use your own uh, platform as well. Perhaps you have your own Zoom you want to use for a meeting, you can use it there too. Uh, and finally, beyond that, there are lots of little niches, a lot of places to sit down um, in the actual conference center itself. Um, I'll just send you the venue page. From there, you should be able to find uh, the layout on floor pan. Um, Oh, actually, I've got access to the PDF here, so I'll send it to you. This should give you an idea, give you an idea of where to go. There's places with coffee signs, which tend to show where the coffee is served, but also it has a lot of chairs there as well. So if you can't organize anything or just want to do things more casually, you can just um, attend to one of those places um, yeah, if you want to do a holiday meeting. So yeah, there's lots of options, as Dan said. Um, on to our another question. Um, Basically, the question is asking, are session materials necessary? Is that information necessary? Um, and is that available on the site or is that part of the assembly? So I'm guessing, is it necessary and um, how integrated it is into the system? So if you could give me your advice on the session material uploads. Yeah, I think it's um, it's really to be encouraged, I think, because um, it provides attendees, um, speakers, um, uh, and anyone else uh, interested in, in or anyone who's just going through the program, um, building up their, perhaps their personal program for the week to see what the session is all about. And the more information you put as a convener uh, up online prior to the, um, the event, uh, the more information that um, uh, attendees have uh, to make decisions about whether to, to view. So you can really use this opportunity in many ways to, to bring more people to uh, your session. And that might mean that you have a paragraph of, of text. It might be that you've got um, a, a figure or an image that might display um, the, the basis of your, your program. Um, so you can upload these materials um, and that essentially provides the context and also gives the legacy to the session as well. So you might go back in years um, years to come might go back to the EGU 24 program because you've, you remember a particular session and the more information that you have about 
the session um, as, as you know it makes that legacy um, uh, much more detailed and uh, able to be found in, in the future. So not just about those attending the GA prior to the event, it's it's uh, also really important to to create a memory of what the GA um, uh, did uh, and what the sessions were all about. So do if you're a convener, um, uh, if you are you know encouraged to put those materials up, uh, please do so and obviously uh, work with your convening team. Uh, to produce something. Um, what I would say uh, in all communications, and I should have said this before, is that um, it's really important um, to use um, uh, gender um, uh, 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 neutral language. Um, uh, and uh, that is something that I, I believe uh, Simon in more of his broader communication um, uh, around the conference can, can speak more about in a second. But what, what I've found in the past is that um, it's much better to to do these things earlier, sooner rather than later. So to be able to go through the text that you're putting up uh, to make sure that it's inclusive um, uh, as possible. It doesn't disadvantage any particular protected characteristic. I don't know if Simon, you want to say something more about uh, about that uh, in sure. your, your role as a project coordinator. Yeah, sure. So I'll just put a link into the accessibility and inclusivity page at UG General Assembly. Um, basically in order to foster a good environment for discussion and discussion ideas, we want to make sure the assembly is working as possible. What you'll find here on the accessibility page is a number of um, guidance on how that's approached. Um, some of that will be just guidance on terms of the technical setups, for example, audio accessibility and visual accessibility. Um, but there's also certain guidance in there. For example, in terms of visual accessibility, it will say, encourage presenters to use avoid using rainbow scales um, as that can be visually uh, inaccessible to people who are more visually impaired. Um, similarly, it's why people should be using microphones as well for people who are audio impaired. So when you're approaching, convening, keep these things in mind. Perhaps that's something to com communicate to your presenters in terms of, for example, avoiding um, rainbow scales. Again, it's about, as I said, language. You'll find uh, guidance on um, promoting inclusive language here, which includes um, making sure people don't feel discriminated in terms of their gender, their age, their st um, stage of career, etc. Um, the link to that is also um, on the page, but a page will generally just say that gender neutral language is um, tried to achieve uh, achieved in all of our communications. Um, um, and on top of that, there's a few other things as well. Like it gives, um, for example, it gives a um, information on, for example, that, that handheld and hand-free microphones are available. But these are also flexible. Um, there's also flexible seating arrangements, etc. So, as well as being useful for yourself, if you do get questions from presenters or other attendees, just follow them to uh, this page I've sent. Um, we also know as a code of conduct, this is, we will see this presented around uh, before a lot of the sessions. Um, and this again, just basically says that people who participate in the, any EG event, General Assembly or not, um, will also have agreed to this code of conduct. That's in the registration page. It just means, again, don't uh, discriminate, don't be prejudicial and strive towards like this inclusive and welcoming environment to promote discussion and scientific progress. Um, I suppose one thing I should say is that if there is a violation in your uh, session and you're worried about that, then you should send an email to conduct at edu.eu. Um, that is sent to two people within EGU um, for who will confidentially um, address what has happened in this session. Um, again, that is also on the web page as well. So, um, any questions, it's just that web page. But if you do have any questions that aren't answered by that web page, please again email edu24 at copernicus.org. So this is the email I've been referring to um, throughout the presentation. Um, and I think that was most of the thing I wanted to say from my side. I will say also, um, aside from con the convening side of things, uh, any um, the career scientist or presenter who has uh, opted in for RSPP. Um, 
it's mandatory they have to upload uh, their presentation at least that includes any of our session material but they have to have uploaded their uh, presentation um this is just because in the case they can't present um for whatever reason um or perhaps um the poster doesn't make it or whatever we can always a backup of going and looking at the material uh, online virtually so the judges will have something to judge and they're not excluded from the competition so if someone is doing OCPP, if they're going to be, um, if the materials can be judged, that must be uploaded online. Um, yes, yeah, so that's, I think, everything from my side of things there. Um, I don't think there's any more questions in the conversation. Um, I think we hit most of the key points, unless there's anything from your experience in the last seven eight-ish years you want to add on at all Dan? Uh, just just to say Simon as I said at the very very start of things that um you know convening a session is um is, is a it's a constant learning um curve so even if you've convened eight nine ten sessions you're always learning about the best ways um about best practice um and I think there is a uh it's just important that however way you do it and there's no right or wrong way in a sense there are some tips and, and um hints and guides that we've we've given in this presentation and this webinar today um but there's no kind of one size fits all approach and uh, each convener will have their own style of convening and, and leading sessions uh, but what i would say is that um the the way that you do it um if you're consistent and uh, you communicate um, as much as possible with the authors, with the chairs, uh, that's really the most important. So however way you'd like to convene the session, just to communicate that with the, uh, the authors uh, and the chairs in the session. Um, and that basically allows everyone to be on the same page. Thanks, Dan. So communication and consistency is key. And do about the technical setup. You'll have people there to guide you through. Um, well, yeah, I think that's uh, pretty much the end of the webinar then. I hope this has really helped you, or at least made you more relaxed in your approach to General Assembly. Um, so now I'll close the webinar. As I said, this recording will be again online um, and published on a YouTube page, uh, on the EG YouTube page uh, next week. Um, with that, I'll uh, say goodbye and I'll see you at General Assembly.